Good evening and welcome to our next installment of our musical offering project. Um, as you know, if you were here with us the last time, Larry and I have been working on this, uh, this, this masterpiece of music and trying to, to come up with a, a, a performance of it that um, it, we, are, we enjoy it and hopefully you enjoy as well. And today we have a very special guest, Michael Morrison. And I'm going to let Larry do the introductions here. So Larry, please tell us about our guest. Sure. Well, Michael Morrison actually needs no introduction to live arts audiences because he's joined us for a few performances <laughs> uh, and has given us uh, some wonderful commentary on the works that we've heard. And uh, But what you may not remember, unless you pull out the program from that time, is that Michael is an internationally renowned musicologist and Bach scholar and um, pertinent to our conversation uh, this evening around musical offering. He's the author of Bach and God, which is a fascinating read. And there's one chapter in there in particular on the musical offering and we'll spend most of our conversation probably talking about that. But uh, welcome, Michael. Oh, good to be welcome. here. Good to see you gentlemen again. <laughs> thank you for thank you for coming. So um, it's interesting because, as Ernie alluded to, we had this conversation a couple weeks ago, and we've assembled um, our own portfolio, as it were, of performances. But we've, you know, put them in an order that makes sense to us from a performance perspective, and you know, but it doesn't necessarily. In fact, I could say it assuredly doesn't line up with sort of the publication schema in as much as people have been able to sort of pull the threads and figure out really what that possibly could be. But you have some really interesting ideas that you present in Bach and God about sort of the nature of the musical offering. So it would be great for us to just be able to talk about that and, and have our conversation around uh, those particular ideas. Yeah, well, I mean, the basic idea is, uh, and maybe you went into some of this in your uh, previous interactions with your audience on this, but the idea was that Bach was visiting his son in Berlin and got called upon to fill up a chamber music evening at the court of Frederick the Great. And those evenings were ordinarily um, filled up with Frederick himself playing uh, six or seven flute sonatas with harpsichord or a couple of concertos and so on, where he's the soloist. And a very particular kind of uh, entertaining, easy to listen to kind of music. And along is old Bach here. And uh, Frederick gives him a theme and says, you know, uh, we'd love to hear you improvise a fugue on this, this melody that I'm, I'm presenting to you. And that, that's the main theme of what uh, uh, eventually becomes this entire publication, uh, the musical offering. So I'll sort of try to take this step by step. So on that particular evening, uh, Bach does in fact uh, uh, improvise a three voice fugue on that melody that's given to him. And uh, he's asked to improvise a six voice fugue on it as well. And you have to imagine that as someone, as a, 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 someone who speaks German, who's from Saxony, who is a guest at the court of Frederick the Great where French is really the main language. and. He has to very carefully say, you know, he says something to the effect of, well, you know, your majesty, not every subject lends itself easily to improvising on six voices. <laughs> you know, this is the kind of thing that you might want to compose. <laughs> even I, even I, the great Bach, might not be able to quite pull this up. But he does then, according to the newspaper reports and so on, other reports, he does improvise a six voice fugue as well, but just not on that subject. And... Uh, he goes around playing these various keyboard instruments at the court and everyone is supposedly astonished by everything that he did. And that, that seems very likely to have been the case. Uh, but Bach himself registers, again, probably very politely, <laughs> some dissatisfaction with what went on and says, well, you know, uh, it would be uh, what, he, what he resolves to do is to compose an ordentliche fuga, a regular or orderly fugue based on the theme given to him. You can imagine him just going back to Leipzig and hunkers down and takes some of maybe what he remembers from that three voice fugue and then composes it into a sort of more sophisticated version of what he might have done before. Some people think that the three part fugue from what is published as his musical offering, the piece that opens the collection, is in fact simply Bach's improvisation. But in a way that doesn't make sense because his whole point was that he was dissatisfied with what he did. It doesn't make sense for him to then 
then write down exactly what he did. If, if he could, I, if he'd remember I, everything. Yeah, if I could just jump in. Yeah, sure, sure. It's highly structured. I mean, that exactly. I, and it, as I go through it, it's astonishingly structured. <laughs> yeah. And I'd be interested actually to ask you, I have some ideas on 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 this, but in no way is it that, you know, I, I've read, like, I think it was originally uh, Hans uh, David. Yeah, well, the reason that he doesn't like it is because it's, 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 its structure is not symmetrical, and he thought that the whole musical offering was symmetrical. And so, I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to know where to start with this, because there are individual elements of the complete collection, and there's the whole collection, and there's, and there's some debate about how it fits together. But as we sort of follow through the biographical aspects of this, what seems to have happened is that Bach went back to Leipzig, he composed this proper three-voice fugue, which is quite sophisticated. I mean, it has very, you know, has um, individual voices imitating each other exactly. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's quite sophisticated. It's, it's hard to believe that he would have improvised all of that. As is so often the case with Bach pieces, they start out sort of very regular at the beginning, and then they gradually become sort of haywire <laughs> as, you, well, I think, I think as you move left. Uh, you know, Larry made a, a point. We were talking about this. Um, we, we've talked about it several times, but he, you, you were talking about this proper orderly fugue and this, and Larry was talking about the structure, but I think Larry was talking about the fact that the three voice Richikar is actually forward looking um, in terms of the way it's written and what it does as a, as a composition, um, which I thought was an interesting sort of point to make. Larry, do you want to? Say I was just saying to me, it's sort of exploratory. I mean, he's using these very sophisticated techniques, but it ends up right. feeling free right. while being very strict. The sixth voice right. to me looks backward, right? I mean, in a sense. Sure, sure. So. And in fact, the sixth voice fugue, it's, it's more sophisticated in the sense that there are six voices altogether, but the actual structure of it is much less sophisticated than the three voice one is in this piece. And one of the other things that's intriguing about for me is, is that those bits that you were describing where there are um, triplets in the right hand and just individual quarter notes in the left hand, that simplified texture of a three to one relationship between the two, that's exactly the kind of texture that you get in most of the music that took place in those concerts that Frederick Great, his flute parts tend to do what the right hand is doing and his bass parts and those flute works tend to do it. And so what I wondered about is that, I think I talk about a little bit of this in, in Bach and God, that right at the point where Bach does start to imitate the style of the French court in the, in the episodes of that opening movement of the musical offering, it suddenly goes down step by step into the dark areas of E flat minor and A flat minor and so on. And this moving systematically into the flat direction into the nether worlds of tonality, that's exactly the kind of thing that Bach does in his church cantatas and passions and so on when you're depicting negativity like... Um, uh, sin or uh, the, uh, or death or sort of grim stuff, and when you're depicting really positive things uh, in the vocal works, you tend to move systematically through the harmonic, uh, through the t tonal world, so to speak, in the sharp direction. So there seems to be kind of a, a potentially sort of um, it's not I'm saying he's making fun of the simple style of the of the Berlin court, but he's, it's certainly not a a 100% clean endorsement of it. It seems to be sort of commenting on it in some ways. So that's an interesting way to begin the collection. And no one doubts that as far as the, uh, the complete musical offering, which is about 45 minutes or so worth of music, that the thing that it starts with is the three voice few. Now, the question is, where does things, where do things go from there? And uh, it's extremely complicated. And I'll, I'll call, I don't, don't want to get carried away talking about this right now, but it's not at all clear that the way that the music ended up being engraved on copper plates so that it could be run off on a, the 18th century equivalent of a uh, copy machine. It's unclear what the relationship is between the way those things were laid down so that they could be copied and what it was that Bach submitted to them to do. It's, some folks have, have argued that exactly the way that it appears in the thing, that's what it is. Your guy, Hans David, didn't like that because it wasn't symmetrical, so he suggested another way. I said, uh, Christoph Wolf has suggested several other possibilities that are actually much more plausible. And then Greg Butler and I have suggested some things that are arguably there are slight variations on that that might be more plausible yet. But the one thing that, the one generalization I would make is that it's interesting that Bach advertised the fact that he had composed these two fugues on the royal theme in an orderly fashion that he said he was going to do. And then he added to that a sonata for violin and flute and, and bass, 
um, which in which the king would presumably play the flute part if he were to play it in a concert in Berlin, which I very much doubt that he did, but we can come back to that. And then bizarrely, there are these 10 canons, sort of whether they belong together or interspersed, again, you know, reasonable people can differ about that. But the intriguing thing is that when Bach sold his, he had about 200 copies run off and he sold them at the uh, trade fairs in Leipzig. They have, as many people know, Leipzig is a great center for international trade. And three times a year, they would have a massive international trade fair. And that's where you could buy books and music and fur coats and <laughs> all kinds of stuff. <laughs> And so, you know, Bach announced when the next fair comes, I'm going to have this musical offering available for purchase. And it was not cheap either. <laughs> and, but then what, what's intriguing was is that the, the newspaper advertised said what the musical offering consists of is one comma, two fugues for keyboard, two, a trio sonata, and three, ten canons, among which is a fuga canonica. I mean, it's amazing that there would be a newspaper advertisement in which you lay out the structure of a collection and specify that one of the canons is a fugue as well. Because he's, I think what he's trying to draw attention to is that there are basically three kinds of music that appear in the musical offering, keyboard fugues, chamber, uh, you know, a, a trio sonata and these um, uh, 10 canons. But the thing that the three disparate things have in common is that there's fugue stuff in there somewhere. So that's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, like a, if the art of fugue is a super art of fugue, this is kind of like a smaller art of fugue on the on the king's melody that he gave him. Yeah, and I'm glad you said that because um, you know I I like to think that I mean there are different ways we can never of course get inside the mind of Bach. No, <laughs> so be nice, but I don't think we can. No. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but you know this idea that I know you'll talk a bit more about that you know of, of sort of who it's really for as it were and one of the questions um, I have and it would be I think in line with all of this is you know in a sense I always think of Bach's last 15 years certainly his last 10 as what so many composers do he's kind of writing for himself right and it doesn't in any way take away from you know his devotion to to God or his right. you know whatever duties he actually had to perform and all of that but you know he was sort of pulling things together I think as so many artists do on his own terms and to me the musical offering fits right into that right I mean as yeah. you, you brought up the art of fugue which reminded me of this, but, yeah. you know, you have the Art of Fugue, you have the Grade 18 Chorales, you have the Clavier Ubung series, the B minor mass, right? Yeah. And so this fits right squarely within that, right? Yeah, and, and another thing that intrigues me about that last 10, 15 years of his life is that a lot of these big collections, not only are they more sort of contrapuntal than ever, <laughs> But a lot, not all of them, but uh, uh, not all of them are contrapuntal. Not all of them have the emotional characters I'm about to say. But also there's a kind of very profound melancholy in a lot of the, that I hear in the, in the late works, especially the musical offering and the art of fugue. And there's some debate about whether that uh, concerto, for example, for harpsichord and flute and violin and A minor, uh, the so-called triple concerto, BWV 1044, at least, uh, all of its three movements were arranged by somebody from previous Bach compositions. The question is whether Bach himself did or not. Um, that too, that even a piece like that, a concerto like that, is this has this sort of severity. And uh, I mean, it's not saying it's negative, but it's, there's this, or even world weary. It's just the kind of it's a it's a it's a it's a serious. it's a greater depth. It's a very yeah. serious, yeah, very very serious. I mean, Bach is always serious. I mean, I've just been listening to even some of his youthful works. I don't know if you've heard recently the the uh, cantata that he wrote for the, it's called, he called it a motetto, but this vocal work that he wrote for the change of town council in Milhausen early in his life, a Gottes mein König. Oh, yeah. oh my God, it is fantastic. Right from bar one of this thing, it's like you're on another planet from anybody else around at that time. And so this is always true of Bach, but you know, that, all the stuff that he's writing around then is, is very sort of uh, excited and, you know, even the even the sad stuff is very sort of beautifully sad, but it doesn't have the kind of whoa that this late repertory has. And that's I mean obviously that's part of you know we, I don't want to be weird, but you know, with the three of us here, we've got some gray hairs growing. <laughs> to, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> it's the light. You, know, you do you do get a little bit more. Uh, it's funny I should say that because that's one of the things that is said in, actually in that town council cantata is that 
you know, for the mayor that they're speaking, it was a help me to wear gray hair with honor when I'm, <laughs> when I'm older and so on. <laughs> How much of this, you know, the, you know, you talk about, um, you know, writing for himself. I also have to wonder as you get older, you become less, ex you, you start to get, get to the point where you've, you've already seen it. You've seen it, you've done it, you've, you've composed it, you've played it. And I wonder in some ways, and I actually, Larry, after our conversation the other night about this three voice Richard R, I, I, I kept going back to it because of the pieces in this set, that was the one I knew the least. Um, I've sort of spent much of my time, much of the time I've known this piece over the years on the sixth voice, because that's always been, you know, if you, as a conductor, you grow up with the Webern setting and you, you sort of realize that this was this tremendous challenge. And so you've gotten me to go back to this, this three voice um, setting. But what I find it's, it's almost like if, when he's doing it for himself, it's because he's looking for the mental intellectual compositional challenge to sort of, to sort of, I don't know whether it's to flex his muscles or just to, to, to keep himself engaged. And I think uh, I, I, off, I have to sort of wonder, um, and Michael, you made a comment uh, about sort of the, you know, if the Sonata was sort of this, something that would, would have not been to, fill, uh, to uh, Frederick's liking, then the canons really with their, w would not have been to his liking with their strict approach. And I wonder whether some of this is Bach saying, you know what, I'm, I'm writing for myself, but I want to do something that challenges me as well as just something to write. Yeah, well, he, it's, it, here's where it's sort of interesting to look at what he actually says in the dedication of the publication, because what would have again, again, would have been normal at that time, if you're dedicating something to, certainly to Frederick the Great, you would write a f flowery dedication in French. And what, and that's what Quantz did, for example, the, the, the flute uh, composer and teacher who worked for a lot of money for Frederick in, in Berlin. Uh, he wrote that flute treatise uh, and he published it in French and German. And there's a French thing that talks about how, you know, it, uh, and so on and so forth. But Bach writes a German preface with fracture, you know, and he, and he doesn't use the traditional language of uh, what you would say even in German is I dedicate these sonatas to you and I don't deserve to breathe the same air that you are. That's, that's usually the kind of thing that you say. And you know, if you're can see some way to uh, honoring your humble servant, that would be really great. You know, this, this, that's the kind of thing that they say. But Bach's, his starts, he says, I wanted to make known to the world what could be done with this theme and so on that required thought and composition. It, it can't just be improvised. And then he says, he, very peculiarly, he says, he uses the verb vian as the verb. He doesn't say dedicate. Widmen is the word in German for dedicate. He says, he doesn't say I dedicate a musical offering to the to Frederick of Prussia. He says, I consecrate a musical offering to Frederick. That's very loaded sort of religious language, which, which makes it sound like, again, again, if he were writing solely for himself, he wouldn't need to choose the king's theme to write on. You could, you could do like what he did in The Art of Fugue, which is he, he supplied his own, his own melodic idea that, that runs through the entire collection. So he clearly did want at least some people to know what it was really possible to do with that theme that the king had given him. And he probably cared a little bit what the king thought too, but not that much because if he really cared about what the king thought, he would have written him six flute sonatas with simple accompaniments and very agreeable. Uh, I mean, Bach might have been able to pull that off. It's sort of hard for him, I think, because he's, he's so serious. I think it really would be hard for him to write it in completely nothing but gallant style all the way through. But theoretically, let's say he could have done that, or at least he should have done that if he really wanted to honor Frederick. But there are these two keyboard pieces, very serious. Who's going to play those at at some night at the, you know, it's one thing to improvise as sort of an entertaining thing for the crowds, but an actual concert of composed music of that sort. And then you follow it up with a sonata. Again, it should be a solo flute sonata for solo flute and continual accompaniment. And so what does Bach write? A four movement church, what's called a sonata de chiesa, where you have two slow movements which followed by two fugal movements. And Frederick himself, independent sources in the 18th century uh, quoted him as saying that he didn't like certain kinds of music there because he says, a schmeck nach der Kirche is how they reported it in German. It smells of the church. 
you know, my God, does the does the <laughs> does this trio sonata from the musical offering? Most of it, I mean, at least the structure of it, smells of the church. And some of my colleagues point out right away, yeah, but look at how how modern and gallant the opening antecedent consequent balanced phrase is at the beginning of the second slow movement. That's classic Berlin gallant. So, yes, of course it is. But that's the whole point. You set it up and then you knock it down. <laughs> and so you get 10 seconds of gallant music in the in this piece. And then he isolates every element from that thing and runs sequences into Q flat minor. <laughs> again. <laughs> you know, okay. well, I, I think I said this in Bach and God, he ends up sort of baroquing the gallant, you know, yeah. so that yeah. that actually makes it even more, you know, I, I I, it's very hard for me to imagine what Frederick would have made of such a thing and also sharing the limelight and with equal violin part and equal, you know, it just, it doesn't make sense as a piece yeah. that's really designed to make Frederick be really happy. And then as you say, oh my God, and then 10 canons, 10 canons based on this theme, it's unbelievable. You know, once some, some of them are upside, backwards and upside down and at half speed and all this kind of stuff. And they've at least half of them sound really grim and funereal. You know, it's yeah. like, is that a way to honor the, the king of Prussia? <laughs> it just seems very bizarre to me. So I, I agree with you that I think that he's not really, he's writing slightly for the king. He's writing slightly for other people. He's writing a lot for himself. He's writing for God. He's, you know, in a way, I don't think he's trying to defend himself aesthetically, but it's, it's like he can't help himself. It's like, I'm going to like get every last ounce of stuff that you can get out of this theme, I'll, you know. And it's not even to like to, to prove other people wrong per se. It's just like it's why you know it's like what people say sometimes about certain ensembles, like the Hilliard ensemble, we will sing really, really slow and really into why do they do it? Because they can. <laughs> <laughs> so. you, know, you know, it seems to me also that, you know, we of course, you know, not having access to knowing him, you know, at, in, in real time and having to rely on contemporary accounts. I mean, it it seems to me that we're dealing with an individual who is quite stubborn. Oh yeah. <laughs> quite headstrong and, and probably not, not sort of the happy chap you want to have at a cocktail party. Um, but, and, and in a way it's almost like he's doing this. It's almost like he's doing it to say, you see, you should, you know, it's, you thought you were going to stump me. However, and it's almost yeah. like he's sort of, uh, he's sort of being passive aggressive in the extreme uh, about this. And, you know, of course, I, I don't know where that comes into the composition, but, but it's, you know, it's just, there's one place in, in, in one of the, the canons where it's an augmentation and it's, you know, it's upside down. And there, there's a place where his approach to writing is so strict and he is not going to yield and alter even a semitone. And what it does is it creates absolute insanity for a second, but it's because of this rigid, you know, uh, way that you know, uh, uh, it's almost like his stubbornness is manifesting itself in some of those canons. Yeah, yeah that's an especially tricky one because there's some, I assume you're talking about the, um, the glorification augmentation canon where yeah. there's, yeah. I don't want to get too nerdy and, and uh, complicated exactly. or something, but there's some, there is some uh, issue about whether you're supposed to actually augment the entire voice or just the first half of it so if you do the entire thing then you get these really bizarre harmonies yeah. and if you don't you get some pretty amazing stuff still so that's it's a little hard to it's a little quite it's a little hard to know it's a little hard to know there but certainly i think the general point is definitely true that um this is a uncompromising character in many ways and you don't compromise even for the king Right. When it comes down to it. And yeah, some have criticized me and said that, you know, well, Bach would never have gone against what a what a what a uh, someone of that stature and so on. That's just not the way court culture works. And, and that's why I, I tr trotted out this um, passage from uh, Bach. One of the other things that he did quite heavily in the 1740s was mark up his personal Bible with uh, annotations. And a lot of people know about these things, but they they know that that happened, but they don't really know exactly what he said or what they add up to or what, what it's all really about. And one of the things I thought was intriguing is that there is a place in there where the, the commentary on a particular passage in the Bible says a, a preacher should never worry about the status of who it is that he's talking to. <laughs> the, the thing that counts is the message. And if, if the message is a valuable godly message it has to be heard 
And I, I think this is another element of what you're saying, Ernie, is that not only is he headstrong, but it's like you young people think that this stuff is dead. <laughs> you have no idea, you know, <laughs> yeah. what, can, what can actually be done with this stuff. And you need to know more before you're allowed to say something like this stuff is dead or moribund or old fashioned or whatever. It may be old fashioned, but old fashioned is not, that doesn't mean it's not valuable. <laughs> right. But the canons to me, I mean, you know, as old fashioned as the kind of presentation is, it's almost like a masterclass on composition. Right? Yeah. Like, fabulous the way that he's taken this theme and what he's doing with it. Yeah, I mean, there's some controversy too about whether the way Bach presents the main theme of the musical offering is truly note for note what Frederick gave him. Certainly the first few notes probably da 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 and that's a standard way to start a lot of a fugues start that way by Handel and other people in the 17th century. And the second half, as you say, is also extremely conventional. There's some question about whether all those half steps or some of those half steps might have been inserted by uh, Bach and that the original was sort of a little bit more sticking to the just to the pitches of the of the scale. It's, it's impossible to know, of course. But uh, if indeed Bach added the the half steps himself to the second half of the theme, that uh, as you uh, imply or are beginning to say, it creates all kinds of interesting possibilities for what you can do with it later that are much more interesting, interesting. but also um, uh, uh, require more skill when you get to the canons part of the, <laughs> of, of the, of the collection, because you're asking for it when you do that, man. <laughs> How mind boggling is it? The very first of the canons in the collection takes the theme from Frederick with its half steps and everything and goes just a, a, a melody all by itself left to right and it sounds pretty good all by itself right. and most people don't play it but i've heard performances where they play the whole thing just the melody all by itself and then they play the whole melody by itself backwards which also sounds pretty good and then you play them together and they harmonize with each other yeah. the one going so that the whole piece just goes like that it's absolutely yeah. fantastic I guess imagine you would think that Frederick, uh, Frederick the Great would have a heart attack looking at even just something as small as that, just that just that one little line of music in there. But sadly, again, as hardly anyone has ever noticed, uh, Bach had the copy that he sent to Frederick the Great himself was printed on special fancy paper with a couple of handwritten things by Bach and Latin in the side and so on. And we happen to know that this the, the manuscript that was owned by Frederick the Great himself passed out of his own library during his lifetime. To, uh, to Kernberger, right? I think Exactly, right. exactly. And so, you know, I'm not saying he was like saying this is garbage or anything. <laughs> if he really thought it was garbage, he would have thrown it in the garbage. But if he was so into it and was so honored by it, well, he certainly didn't keep it <laughs> till, till the know, end of his life, you know. So I think it's, you know, it's just... Uh, back to what Ernie was saying before this, uh, not the nerve exactly, but the, the mindset that could compose something like this and think that this is something that is, it's, it's, it's moving in a way to see someone who, who, who says, I'm going to do this thing that's totally amazing and, and is very out of touch with <laughs> what's going on in the world, but I think it's really valuable. And so I'm going to put it out there and at my own expense, you know, it's, it's astonishing. I think did, um, and then going from memory, you'll know this though right away, I'm sure. I think it's David Yearsley who talks about how it's, you could assume that it was a presentation to Frederick, but it's in a sense consistent with a mind view of a pre-enlightenment Lutheran, right? Which is this kind of absolutist yeah. view of monarchy, which again, would not, would not contradict in any way this idea that in fact, it might even reinforce the idea that yeah. you know, you're, submitting for God, but of course you would see a ruler as, you know, being God's chosen on earth. Oh yeah, no, it's very clear from uh, various things that Bach himself has uh, notated in his Bible and from things that uh, are said in the particular, in both the church cantatas and the secular cantatas. Um, and I see that there's, uh, the way I look at that is that um, people have wondered for a long time whether the the verbal content of Bach's voc vocal music is something that he would have actually agreed with. There's no reason in principle why he would have to. You could you could just write stuff to please your employers and have your own private views about that are that, at variance with that. But as it happens, Bach's private views are known from these private annotations and they correspond completely. 
And it's very clear from these annotations and from all the stuff that is uh, said in the uh, vocal works that the office of king and the office of prince, those things are sacred and are not to be questioned. What you can do is question whether any particular person in everything that they do are actually fulfilling right. the God-given office. And so I think the way that Bach would probably have looked at that is that Frederick, of course, has every divine right to be king, and we, we need to have a king, and we need order in the world, and so on and so forth. But it's possible for the king to be wrong about some stuff. And for the stuff that's really important that, that God, that I know God's on my side on, I'm allowed to argue against the king about that. It doesn't threaten the fact that he's king. It's just simply disagreeing with his world and life view. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we've had fun putting these together, I'm telling you. <laughs> It's um, we've had, you know, it, it's the, to, for me, the joy is in doing something musical with these as opposed to just looking at them as museum pieces, which I don't believe right. they are. I, I really think the more I the more I, time I spend with these, um, the more I uh, the more I feel like these are this, this is this is wonderful music and it, it, it needs to be played expressively and beautifully. And uh, Ab absolutely. In fact, that's one of the things that's irritated me for a long time, too, is that people talk about the late counterpoint of Bach as being abstract. Mm -hmm. And what they often mean by that is that sort of implied in what you're saying to is that they're 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 great for the intellect and the eye. And they're very impressive in the way that they're put together. But in some sense, they're not really meant to be played. I mean, they can be played, but playing them is a kind of trivial sort of thing. The real substance right. of it, as it were, is in the what's on the what's on the page. And I think that the musical offering in particular speaks very strongly against that idea, not only because it sounds so great and because it's fun to perform right. and so on, but even just looking at the actual materials that Bach published as that those copper plate things that I was saying were run off that he sold at the trade fairs, they sometimes specify an instrument. They sometimes, they sometimes the counterpoint is altered a little bit in the, you know, there, or even just the mere fact that you can, that you can play right. six, a six voice thing with two hands. Right. The statistical likelihood of that being the case, if it wasn't composed to be played on two hands right. is, is pretty and minimal. And that it's written out that way too. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ex ex exactly. And there are um, trills and there are staccato markings and slurs. Right. And so you want to say, are staccato markings and slurs, are those abstractions? <laughs> <It's> like, those <laughs> are performance yeah. indications. You know? <laughs> so you still have writing, you know, from the mid 20th century that talks about like part of fugue is being abstraction because people didn't recognize it as keyboard notation. Right. Because they're used to close score and sort of late, right. you know, late 18th century and on keyboard notation, or even just 18th century, but they weren't right. aware. I mean, all you have to do is go back to Frescobaldi and, you know, uh, as, and, and, well, and that's even, even that's partly a mechanical thing, because if you're going to publish them engraved or with music printing, it's very difficult to. To, to, to do that so that's why that's why those those yeah. multiple voice things are, are that's why it's a convention for keyboard pieces to be right. Right. but there are manuscripts in box handwriting of fugues from the art of fugue and of there's a key the six voice fugue from the musical offering there is a there's a manuscript surviving of that and they're written on two steps making it very clear that it's a keyboard <laughs> piece you know? and i so. like to say an organ piece but that's right yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, you know, if you if you want to, I can play with thirty second excerpt right on Zoom here of a Zilbermann piano, an original Zilbermann piano from seventeen forty seven. It is That's fantastic. It. You'll love it. Let's sounds it. like sounds okay. like this.
Wow. Ah, oh, beautiful. Cool, no? Wow, that is so gentle. Yeah. So delicate. Wow. All right. Well, this has really been fascinating, and I Fabulous. appreciate your taking time to, to just talk with us about it, because it's it really is an interesting work. Oh, yeah. a great, a great pleasure, and I can't wait until we're able to get together in person again and do stuff, you know, in person at the concert venues of your organization. That will be wonderful. I, I am looking forward. As soon as we, as soon as we can come back, uh, we're gonna have to figure out a way to get you down here because <laughs> it's just too much fun. All right. So, Ernie, excellent. Want to take us out here, so to speak? Uh, again, yeah. Take us. Well, I, actually, <laughs> again, thank you for coming. Thanks especially to Michael for for sharing his knowledge and his love of this wonderful subject. Uh, and thank you, for, Larry and I have a great time doing this, but it is always great having someone else who uh, can add a different perspective to this. So thank you. And on behalf of Larry Molinaro and myself and Bach Plus, thank you to Michael and we'll see you inside with some music. <laughs>